Dude, come on, let's go. Welcome in, Bears fans, to another episode Woo! of the Vines My Podcast. Unbelievable. We've got my, my pal here, Rick Flair, if you want to say hello. What's up? <laughs> nice, classic. All right, so hopefully you guys have seen the video that we uploaded recently. Um, weird for me to say because it hasn't actually been uploaded at the time of recording this, but Justin Fields appears to have been ranked on the top 100 players list for t- the, the 2023 season, the past season. Um Yep. So if you guys have not seen that video, please go ahead and check it out. Um, but today on this episode, what we wanted to talk about was kind of reaction to the 1920 Football Drive episode the Bears released on uh, Wednesday of this past week. And just give some uh, reaction and a little bit of expectations for the wide receiver room because kind of the back half of the episode was focused on that. Um so the video started out and was really, really cool. And like I said, about halfway through, they ended up talking about the wide receivers. And it, I believe Teak Tolbert, the wide receivers coach, he had a, a slew of things to say about pretty much all of the players. And I'll try my best to mix in some quotes. And I've got Nick in on this as well, of course. He'll be able to kind of sprinkle in some of what I documented here. Um, but the first name that Tolbert mentioned was Darnell Mooney. Obviously, he went on to quote and say that Darnell Mooney was like, the only guy that people knew about but now we've added some playmakers throughout the room so of course Mooney was the only really returning player that um was worth a damn the last year drafted Valus Jones who didn't really pan out and then obviously in the offseason they acquired DJ Moore to pair with the receiver they traded for in the middle of last season which was Chase Claypool um but from that point essentially he went on to call DJ Moore elite and went on to say that Chase Claypool is a large human being with physical tools that will always help the quarterback. So essentially, he's really highlighting how the wide receiver room had been upgraded. Now, Nick, I believe I gave you a quote that I think that you should read out for Tolbert because it kind of gives some insights as to what happened with Claypool last year and kind of what we can expect for this year. Uh, Yeah, so Tyke Tolbert ended up talking about Chase a little bit in the video. Um, He went on to say that uh, I think, and, and what he said here, Uh, I think when Chase came in the middle of the last season, everything was new to him. He had to pick up the offense, the formations, the shifts, the motions. But I think this year, starting new with everybody else, I mean, he's the full grasp of our offense now. So I think you'll see a better production from this year. Um, It's a lot to say for him. Uh, I know that a lot of people were very disgruntled with the Chase Claypool trade last year. Um, And like Darnell Mooney just said that how how big of a guy Chase Claypool is. I mean, even Tech Tober went on to talk about this a little bit, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Pretty much talked about how big of a human being he is and how everyone kind of seems yeah. to forget that you're in a 4 4 40 when he, came he on highlighted the physical tools first and foremost and right. then he went on to have that quote that nick said essentially just backing up the the fact that the player himself is a great human being physically but learning an nfl offense as we can learn from the quarterback series on netflix if you guys haven't seen it go check it out um it, it's not easy to just come into a new city learn a new offense and produce at the highest level um Tolbert went on to say later in the video that the focus of the wide receiver room during training camp is have the ability to play, uh, to play fast, no mental errors like what I just had, and to protect the ball. Mm. So um, learning the offense is a highlight to what is going on here, and I hope that they got DJ Moore in early enough for that to not be an issue, and I really don't think it is on top of his elite athleticism and just playmaking ability. Um, but with everyone in-house, I think that you can see the offense gel, especially the passing offense here. Um, addition with Robert Tanya as well. So bevy of options there for Fields. And Tolbert from 1920 Football Drive really makes it seem that the offense is primed to offer a lot more um, as opposed to the team that got the first overall pick this this past year from the, the their play. Um, I know, Nick, there's a quote that I think that Tolbert had around Justin Fields as well. And again, just some more insight as far as everything meshing. Yeah, he went on to talk about Justin and how he has extreme confidence in the guys in his, uh, on his side of the ball because of the communication they have both on and off the field. I mean, you could see from, I mean, I don't know if you, if, if you guys have seen the 1920 football drives in the past or it's just kind of been keeping up with everything on Twitter and what's been coming out uh, about the team, but they stay very, very close together. They get to know each other on and off the field, whether that's uh, working on plays, traveling to Florida, uh, running routes with each other, throwing the ball, and then when it goes to possibly going, you know, going to uh, baseball games, basketball games, um, kind of meshing together, getting dinner with each other, really just getting to know each other on a personal level. Something that you need to do to build that chemistry. Or on. There's been a lot of chemistry, and what something you guys may notice throughout the episode, um, there was a sense of camaraderie between rookie defensive tackle draft picks, um, 
Gervon, Gervon Dexter, and Zach Gervon Pickens. Dexter. Those were the two human beings that got um, uh, Meet the Rookies released by the Bears first. Um, they weren't the first pick, of course, for the Bears, but those were kind of higher picks, and they addressed a position of need. I thought that the Dexter pick was a little bit um, unique in the sense that he's not a guarantee by any mean, but he is definitely more flashy and has he's more of a project. Um, so maybe you think that they're going to be competing against each other, and I'm sure that they are. But throughout the 1920 football episode that we're referring to, they really had a nice, strong sense of camaraderie. And if that can translate to the position groups, a.k.a. what we were talking about with the wide receivers, um, maybe a Claypool won't be mad if he doesn't get as many targets if he's the third option, as long as he can make the most of those, you know, um, opportunities. Um, I think Nick also mentioned that, um, there was a podcast recently released. I think the user, the human being's name is run it back, Dave, running back, Dave, but, yeah, um, podcast is a Bears film room. There you go. Good shout out. He, uh, he was able to get Tyler Scott on the podcast. So bravo to them. That's a, that's a really big fish in my opinion. But, um, he mentioned, and something I just saw recently was that, uh, Tyler Scott mentioned that Claypool was an extremely good human being. He was one of the first people to introduce themselves to Tyler Scott's family. So kind of this overall sense of camaraderie here. It seems like they're in a much better spot to be able to set themselves up to succeed. And it's going to end up, you know, it's going to go in the quarterback's hands, obviously. But let's see what the actual final product here is. Um, Nick, I want you to get everything off of your chest here regarding what you saw with the 19 football, 1920 football drive. Jeez. Um, but the last thing I also wanted to mention real quick was that throughout the episode, um, Luke Etsy had flashed multiple times, obviously. And one of the things that I saw that caught my eye and that I really appreciated, speaking of Tyler Scott, was that the coaching that Getsy was offering for the wide receivers between Tyler Scott, who's a rookie, and DJ Moore, who is a brand new acquisition, acquisition um, essentially first round pick and a, just an elite player, he was giving the exact same coaching. He was saying, okay, let's have some hard cuts on the insteps. And it was literally the exact same thing. And I'm sure that the Bears wanted to kind of keep it brief and maybe not offer too much coaching to see what they are trying to teach them so that they don't give their opposition, you know, a leg up, so to speak. Um, but I thought it was really cool that Getsy would keep it consistent and. Again, I think that that just speaks volume to just being a good coach. Um, I know we had an episode that we released recently regarding which one of the primary coordinators, offense or defense, with Getzi or um, Alan Williams, who has right. more to prove. Um, but that was something that really struck me, and I, you know, I like that from Getzi. Um, but Nick, I, I, I'm done. Um, what, what's something that I think? Oh, I had a good question. I lost it, man. What was something that stood out to you in particular from the 1920 Football Drive episode, if anything? Uh, I think one of the biggest things that stood out to me is when Ryan Poles was talking to Matt Eberflus. Um, he said that from the team he's been a part of with the Kansas City Chiefs, especially with Matt Eberflus with the Colts, yeah. that they've never seen a training camp kind of mesh the way that this training camp has, the way that the players have kind of come together and really formed that bond of a team. Um, now, really I cool think... Kind of be- Oh, go ahead. I, I, I don't want to cut you off. The one thing that comes to my mind was that he, I think they were talking about the rookie organized uh, team activities, the OTAs, yeah. where the rookies, it, it can be kind of a shit show. And with the Chiefs obviously winning, you're going to have worse draft picks. Um, and it's easier for a team like the Bears with the first overall pick to get a good selection of guys. But it's always a roll of the dice. But they seem very confident with this group of rookie players, according to what we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's cool to see that the way that everyone's meshing together, the way that everyone's kind of, you know, understanding that, you know, this was a bad team last year, but they all want to come in and help this team become one of the best in the league. Um, and it's nice to see that everyone has that same kind of drive and that same. Okay, okay. Um, if there's nothing else that you can think of off the top of your head from the 1920 football drive episode, I want to keep it really consistent with the wide receivers. Um, as far as with training camp, the primary thing here is to get the players into the tip-top condition. You want them to learn your offense, and you, you need to essentially give um, job interviews to who's going to make your team. So if you're the Chicago Bears, first and foremost, uh, Nick, as far as your team-building philosophy here, how many wide receivers would you carry into the season? Would it be I'd five, six. six? You would carry six. Okay. Yep. Um, no trades. No cuts, no roster bubble, nothing or others, no undrafted free agents. Just the human beings who are on the Bears today, um, July 20th. I had to think about it. 
Who do you think are the six that the Bears will carry into the upcoming season? DJ, Mooney, Claypool, Bayless, Tyler, and I'd say EQ. So from there, notable cuts are Webster and Dante Pettis? Give me one second. I'll be right back. Absolutely. Um, for what it's worth, I agree with Nick. I think that um, the fact that you've got six, I don't think they'll do seven. The The sixth spot is really interesting because you know your top three with DJ Moore, Darnell Mooney, Chase Claypool. And fourth slot, I'll have to give to the rookie, Tyler Scott. Um, I don't think you can stash him on the practice squad or anything like that, and I think he's too valuable for that. So there's your four. Number five is an interesting one. Do you want it to be EQ St. Brown for his combination of blocking ability? And um, he's really got some non-the-field ability as well because you saw kind of what he was able to do against his former teammate. I think he burned. I, I, I know Jair Alexander got beat by Nikhil Harry. That's, that's an interesting name, by the way. Nikhil Harry is a player for the Chicago Bears and... Actually, is he under contract? I have no idea. I'd, I'd like Nick to fact, fact check that for me. And maybe I'll see if I can do that real quick here. Um, but you have to kind of think of positional value. So for your fifth and sixth wide receivers, you need them to contribute on special teams. And one of those players, um, whether it's going to be Dante Pettis or hopefully Velas Jones because of the stock that they invested in him with uh, third, a third round draft pick, I'm pretty sure. You want that player to be your punt and or kick returner. Probably just going to be your punt returner. But we all know what happened with Valus Jones last year. It was uh, it was tragic. Now, do I think it's fair to just throw that into the wayside and say, yeah, you screwed up, that's it? Um, maybe. Um, I think it wouldn't be very fair to the player. But with a third-round pick, you'd like to get something out of him. And he has raw talent. He's very, very fast. Um it was an awkward draft pick drafting that player, but I think you needed something in the wide receiver room before you went on and addressed the two studs that you have as your potentially one and two wide receivers now. Um, and it was worth a roll of the dice, and he has the talent, like the speed. You see it. Um, so, yeah, I think that Nick's list is totally correct. Um, I think Pettis out of the door is fine. Um, I don't know if having Pettis and Bayless Jones along with Tyler Scott is the correct play there. I think that you keep EQ St. Brown because of his familiarity with Getze, the Green Bay Packers offense that they both came from um, the year before this past year. And he is a good blocker. He he has the ability to make some catches when needed, but he also showed that he's very likely to drop the ball as well. Um, yeah, I just want to keep this guy going along here because I have no idea when Mr. Nick's going to be coming back. Um, if you guys are interested at all in kind of in all like a roster series as far as who do you think is going to make the team and just the episode it would just be names essentially for the entire roster um that is something that we can definitely provide you guys um i remember last year after the vikings game um i don't know if i was bored or what but i ended up creating a depth chart on what i thought the bears depth chart was after the end of the season before the draft so we can compare that Seven or not seventeen man that would be I'm thinking seventeen game, but fifty three man roster to what the Bears could potentially be trotting out in this upcoming season. Um, see if it really is going to be justifying the Bears getting a lot more draft picks than what we thought, um, or a lot more wins rather than what we ended up having and getting the number one overall draft pick. That was where the uh, the thought process was coming from there. Um, if you guys are liking the content, obviously. I mentioned this in the last video that we are on the road to 50 subscribers. Hopefully we're surpassed that at this point. Um, but we're on the road to 50 and ultimately 100. Nick and I are also planning on releasing a like a goals video to kind of see where we want the channel to be. Maybe even at the end of the bear season. Because when you start training camp as a football player, I'm sure that you talk about your goals as a team, as an individual, everything like that. Um, it might be something cool to release as something for a bears content creator. Um, but if you guys are interested in seeing that or just helping out the channel, leave a like, subscribe, um, leave a comment, let us know if you guys are interested in that type of content, whatnot. Um, it's really nice to interact with you guys. So this is technically going to be the third video that we have uploaded to this channel that hasn't been live. Um, we, the idea for the channel has always been interacting with a live audience and we really, really want to do that. Um, 
I think that having more of a close-knit group of fans who interact with each other is a lot better than just very popular clickbaity videos, in my opinion. Um, there is always a little bit of search engine optimization because we want the content that we produce to be seen, but it's not all about the clicks all the time. Um, so again, if you guys are liking the content, subscribe, and we'd love to see kind of where this thing can lead. Um, we have a Twitter as well that we advertise. And ultimately, sorry, I'm trailing at the, or uh, rambling at this point. But um, what I wanted to mention was making sure you guys are subscribed with notifications on would help you guys with when we go live. And Nick and I, I don't know if we've really officially discussed it, but I think that it would be really cool on this channel to be able to have um, kind of a live viewing session. Obviously, on like a YouTube or something, we couldn't display the Bears game for you guys. Not sure if you'd be able to listen to the audio with us. Um, that's something to think about as well. If you guys are interested in some sort of like watch along series, maybe there's a little bit of fun stuff going on with the discord as well. Hopefully that dog's reaction means that Nick is coming back here soon. Um, yeah, all good stuff. It looks like the man of the hour has officially returned, which is great stuff because I'm getting very long on the tooth here and I'm sure you guys have loved that. Welcome back. All right. Sorry about that. I'm back. It's no worries at all. We're still recording, if that's okay with you. Um, okay. I was in a ramble. I just wanted to fill you in so you know what's going on. I mentioned the potential of us releasing a video regarding our goals. I know that we've talked about that. Yeah, and definitely. then I don't know if we've officially discussed talking about watch-alongs, live watch-alongs. Obviously, I can't show the Bears game on YouTube, per se. I, I mentioned some potential Discord shenanigans. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, but we could definitely be live and either watch without audio or hopefully with audio the bears games um and see where that kind of goes off because again this video has been one that is not live it was recorded off of a live stream and kind of want to get back to the roots one day with uh, the live content um but but nick the, the last thing that i had before you left was the top six wide receivers going into camp or going out of camp i guess after camp who do you take into the the season and unfortunately boring answer i fully agree with you um <laughs> I mentioned positions five and six in the depth chart at wide receiver need to offer some special teams flexibility. And if you're not going to go downfield and make a tackle, you've got to do something with the ball in your hands. And I would right. like that to be Valus Jones as opposed to Dante Pettis. Um, yeah. Do you think it's fair if the Bears think that Pettis is just straight out better than Valus Jones? Is a third round pick that you invested to him last year, would you cut Valus Jones? No, I wouldn't cut Valus Jones. Um... Because Tyler okay. Scott has to be on the roster. You can't stash him on the practice yeah. squad. So there's mm -hmm. your fourth, along with the top three, the three-headed monster, okay. we'll, we'll call it. Um, five and six, I think that EQ St. Brown you can't force out because of his blocking ability. He's just such I a was, good tool. Yeah, you know, literally he's familiar, say, he, he's familiar yeah. with the offense. Yeah, if he's put on the practice squad, he's going to another team. EQ? Yeah, strictly for his blocking ability. I mean, he I think, I think EQ, EQ would just say, cut me. He, he wouldn't want to go practice squad. Yeah, he's got too Probably. much talent. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like you have to keep Velas Jones over Pettis. I mean, you drafted the guy. You drafted Velas. Um, you have to see what you have in him. You have to develop him. Um, not to mention last year, he was very dangerous on the kickoffs. He was getting you to the 35-40 yard line pretty consistently on the kickoffs. Um, field position is a huge thing in the game of football. Uh, I feel like that's worth a little bit more than having Dante Pettis, who maybe might be reliable for catches. What did you just say? That. Did you did you say that Velas Jones was a kick returner? Yeah, he did. Uh, maybe in preseason. I'm pretty sure that that was Juice, man. I think that was Herbert. Mm, Bayless Jones was a kick returner for about the end of the half se uh, last, ha last half end of the season. Well, Bayless Jones I damn sure really started really as your punt returner. Really yeah, but he and got that really did not end well. He he lost two games. Yeah. Um, all, all for the number one pick, though. Okay, it worked out. Um, but yeah, he was uh, on the kickoffs that he did. Uh, and the participating wrong. in, he was taking them to about the 30, 35, 40 yard line, which is great for our offense because um, if you just go strictly off of uh, the beginning kickoff, like the kickoff to start the game, Bears were, I think, the number one team in the league with going on their opening drive, which is actually insane to think about that they were seeing the league. Not a touchdown, just scoring drive. points, right? Correct, scoring points. I think, I think you're right. I, I, th I think that that was something that frustrated me last year, yeah, because they did they start pretty like decent. 60, yeah, I think they scored on 65 or 70% of their. And I think the next next team up was like. Uh oh, your mic, your mic. Are you close enough? Yeah, sorry, I, I might have just uh, quieted my voice. Uh, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah it, it cut you off. 
but yeah, I mean, it's insane to, to see that they were number one in the league on scoring in the opening drives. Which, yeah, like, and I don't know if that's an indicator against Fields. I don't think it is. Maybe it's something to think about. Um, hate to keep bringing up this quarterback series, but man, I'd love to see Fields on there. Um, yeah, I mean, I would. That would be that would be insane. I'd watch. I'd binge it. I, it would be hard not to binge it. I mean, they did show Fields a little bit when they were uh, when Kirk Cousins was going over some film. Uh, they were looking at how I believe the what team was it uh, that came out with a lot of blue? Um, wasn't the giant the was it the Titans? God, I can't remember what. Team. Mahomes they, talked about how good the Titans were and how they always struggled against the Titans because of Rabel. What team did the Vi- the Vikings played a team? And they're very man coverage heavy, very blitz heavy. Um, that so sounds like the Ravens. That sounds like the Ravens. No, because the Bears, the Bears played them last year. Um, the Bears played them. What are you talking about? Yeah, because hold on one second. Bears. Okay. Bears. Yeah, I've only seen the first three episodes again of the quarterback series, and I want to watch more. I just have another time. But Nick says um, that he's completed all of it already. Yeah, it was the. You're muted again. Is this an issue on my end or you? Can you can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. I don't know what's going on. Um, I cannot remember what team the Commanders. I think it was maybe the Texans. It was either the Commanders or the Texans that the Vikings ended up playing. And her cousins went back to watch some film on uh, Justin Fields and how uh, they were kind of taking on the man coverage and the. So I uh, just a caveat. I it, are you it. talking about the Lions? No. Nope. Okay. Yeah, I'm not too sure, man. You'll see it eventually. I believe it's like the fifth yeah. episode. Point of the the moral of the story here is Justin Fields on the quarterback series would be yeah. Would I don't want to say nut. Um, that would be some crazy, crazy stuff right there. Um, I feel like Nick, next year, I'd like to. I would sorry to cut you off, but I feel like next nope. year I'd like to see maybe Dak Prescott, Justin Fields, and then uh, one of the rookies, either Bryce Young or C.J. Stroud. But that's just did did, did you did the quarterback series include any of the Super Bowl or playoffs? Yeah, it, from, it from Mahomes. Included, uh, yeah, it included the entire playoff series from Mahomes, and it included uh, kind of the explanation too, as well for uh, Kirk Cousins on why he ended up throwing that six-yard out route rather than throwing. Yeah, just... yeah, I think in um, like the trailer series or the first episode, I think that that line was revealed. So yeah. you you really want a quarterback who's going to be going deep into the playoffs, and yeah. the two human beings who I think would be up next for that Patrick Mahomes role are in the same conference. And those two human beings would definitely be one of Joe Burrow or Josh Allen. Give me one of those on that quarterback series next. That would be awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah, I would. I think I would like to see Joe Burrow more over than Josh Allen. Um, I think. Josh would Allen's you? Jo- Josh Allen has been doing a lot of podcast work, a lot of a lot of audio just, clips of him floating around. Yeah, I I hear just, that Joe Cool is just a quiet kid. He doesn't say too much. It's yeah, not awkward. He did, he did a podcast not not very long ago. I believe his rookie season. He did a podcast with the Nelk Boys and kind of was going over how it was. Burrow. Yeah, Joe Burrow. Okay. Um, he did a podcast with the Nelk Boys going over his rookie season and everything like that, um, which was pretty cool to see. Um, I don't know. I think the media has kind of been all over Josh Allen. They've kind of been riding him a little bit. Um, but I, I think I would love to see Joe Burrow or Josh Allen. I, I would just love to see how he came into the NFL and was immediately quality NFL. Crazy rebound for uh, Josh Allen, by the way. His his start to the NFL was draft oh, yeah. day. There yeah, was, was some, some colorful tweets. So, yeah. for him to be where he's at right now, probably strictly just from his play, because I don't see him as much of like a, a huge trash talk or anything like that. Um, but just from his play, he he's turned it around, and yeah, I'd I'd like to hear from him. I think that he would be a good candidate for that series. Um, I think that Peyton Manning is going to be able to find a way to have them engineer any any player be good. I would I I think imagine if they choose the Steelers and they have this like a uh, this dual thing going on with Pickett and Trubisky, and Trubisky takes over. And maybe huh. Trubisky takes them to the playoffs, but then they lose yeah. the first round or something like that. That would be um, some awesome content that went there, because I, I love Trubisky. Um, did you get a lot more of Nagy in the series as well? Is there a lot more with him? Because in the first three really, episodes, he was there like all over. There really isn't much of Nagy. There's not a lot of talking. Um, it's more so, honestly, when you take a look back and... Well, not when you, look back, when you take a step back and kind of watch the series... You kind of see how Mahomes is more so explaining things to Nagy than Nagy. Oh yeah, definitely. And Mahomes Nagy or uh, is... Mahomes was propping Nagy up in like the social yeah. world, just trying to get him essentially off the team and give him a better coaching job as just you know his right-handed quarterback man. But yeah, Mahomes 
He doesn't need him. <laughs> yeah, Mahomes really doesn't need anybody. I mean, he's everything you want to need in a quarterback right now in the NFL. Um, he's far and far ahead any other quarterback right now. Um, and it's insane how intelligent he is in on and off the field. Um, the, but yeah, Chiefs, the Chiefs organization is run perfectly with their coaching staff because on Wednesdays, was it, they have their, you know, uh, like the, the lab or whatever Andy mm-hmm. Reid called it. You have to get the plays perfect, execute them, and then read them off to um, Big Red there and see if he likes to implement it into the game plan. So, yeah. And that, that that's like it boosts morale. It makes the players have fun. Um, that, that's just a well-run organization. I was thinking about this earlier too. I wonder if – Reed will never coach again after Mahomes because I I think that the only reason he's coaching right now because he had all that stuff going on with his brother and stuff. Reed's probably only coaching because of how good Mahomes is, and it makes his job easy and uh, super fun. But once yeah. Mahomes either retires, I don't see him ever leaving the Chiefs or the Chiefs ever letting him go willingly. Um, right. I think that that that's the the final marriage for Reed there, and that could be another ten years, but at least. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it'd be hard to walk away from that, walk away from having Mahomes. Maybe if they win the next two Super Bowls, right, maybe Reed will be like, yeah, fuck this, but I don't know. And then it'd be interesting to see what, what Mahomes is without Reed. You know what I mean? I mean, I know I know that Mahomes is an amazing player, and uh, a lot of the credit does go to him for being an amazing quarterback, but, I mean, how much of that is ended up predicating on Reed being a top head coach in the league, getting those plays that he does have, and uh, his offense, his offensive mind. So I think um, in two more years that will become muscle memory for Mahomes and that will kind of cement him as like I agree. the very the very potential goat. And yeah. I think it would make it very easy for anyone who comes in to just be competent and say, Okay, Mahomes, what to have what have you guys run? What do you like? What do you don't like? And then that that player will add some pizzazz. Almost like what um well maybe this isn't fair. But I feel like the guy who came in as a head coach for Green Bay he didn't do too much for the Packers except implement like a run game. Um, but I'm sure that passing offense was very, very similar, if not the exact same to what Rodgers has been running for a long time. Um, right. Whereas like a Kevin O'Connell came in and it feels like they really changed things for Cousins and the offense there because Cousins says, oh, I got to get used to all this stuff, you know. Um, but anyway, I feel like we're a bit rambling here. Um, so, Nick, is there anything else, closing thoughts that you've got for the episode today? No, I mean, other than just kind of, it's great to see that the Bears team is coming together the way that they are. I mean, this is unlike anything that I've seen in the past few years from uh, being a fan of the Bears. Um, I, I feel like we're really building a solid, solid culture. Like Ryan Pulse said that. He's gonna yeah, you've got you've got some weird things going around culture-wise with the Vikings, with their very fast new wide receiver, so to speak. <laughs> you've got the the Lions who are gambling on themselves winning the division. Little play on words there. And then you've got a Green Bay Packers team who is bringing in, what, XFL talent to compete with their QB1 now? Um, yeah, Alex Goff or something like that. He's the was the USFL MVP or something like it's that. A, it's a little bit different than Claypool going over overseas to London and Justin Fields hanging out with kids just trying to better their communities. Just a little bit different. So I think the Bears are finally doing something correct, which is really a, it's a breath of fresh air. Right. Alrighty, Nick, I think that we done good. I think we got to cut it here. Guys, like I said in my little spiel while Nick was gone, if you enjoy the content, please leave a like, subscribe on our road to 50 subs. Um, And until next time, and as always, bear down. Bear down, boys.